hello and welcome back to another Blu-ray review and in this video we're going to be talking about the latest in the Masters of Cinema range. This is by number 273 and is a film in a genre I don't care for all that much. So this will be an interesting review to say the least. It is Violent Streets, a film by Hideo Gosha. This film was released in 1974 in Japan, uh, produced by Toei Studios, and as I said, um, the Yakuza genre. Well, I didn't say that it was a Yakuza film, but I would I would gather anyone who looks at this front cover, which is a gorgeous piece of artwork, um, uh, newly commissioned and uh, painted by Tony Stella. Not that I know whether, whether it's painted or digitally drawn or whatever the case may be, but it's a beautiful piece of artwork. And I think you gather when looking at it that it's a it's a Yakuza film. My my experience with the, the Yakuza genre is, is very limited, and I think it is almost entirely limited to the works of Seiji and Suzuki. So I, I don't know, maybe I just don't gel with Suzuki's style of Yakuza um, movies. Because I, I've gone on record, I don't know if it'll be within grabbing distance. Um, I've gone on record as saying that um, Use of the Beast is the only film in the Master Cinema collection that I've seen to date that I just didn't really like that much. Uh, here it is. Ooh. Yeah, so 1963, Nakatsu, um, Youth of the Beast. Oh, I just didn't gel with this one. And uh, But, you know, I'm, I'm a slave to the collection, so it stays, of course. But uh, so when Violent Streets was announced, I was like, ooh. This would be interesting because now I'm watching them all as they come out, which is exciting for me. I'm enjoying that process, but yeah, I was not sure how I'd feel going into Violent Streets, but that almost made me more excited than if it were a film I knew I'd be all in on anyway. So let's talk about it, Violent Streets. This film came out during a very interesting time for the Yakuza genre. So in the 60s, samurai movies were kind of a bankable um genre for, for Japanese film and on, on television as well, which goes back to Hideo Gosha, who started with samurai movies in the 1960s, and Three Outlaw Samurai was actually adapted from his own television series, Three Outlaw Samurai. So moving into the 1970s, I think probably the, the leaked, I mean, Youth of the Beast was 1963, but, you know, um, the Yakuza films really took a turn in the early 70s, the year before Violent Streets came out, a little-known film called Battles Without Honor and Humanity, which spawned um, a, a big series of movies by Kenji Fukusaku. And that kind of introduced a kind of different style to the Yakuza genre, which was very popular, which is kind of um, making things feel more real, like newsreel style, almost documentary style, fly on the wall, fast cuts, you know, um, shaky handheld camera, Things that really draw you into this visceral world of, of, of gang warfare, basically. So Violent Streets comes along in 1974. I believe it was the second uh, Yakuza movie that Hideo Gosha made. And it kind of stands out as not being that. It's a bit more a bit more slick and stylish, I think. And, you know, going through the extras on this release, you know, even Tony Raines, the great Tony Raines is saying that, you know, Hideo Gosha doesn't have any kind of you know, there's nothing fancy about the way his films look. You can't look at any of his films and say that's a Hideo Gosha film by the way that it looks. He, you know, he doesn't really um, provide you with interesting imagery in his films. And I disagree wholeheartedly with that in terms of at least just this one. Um, I don't think I've seen another Hideo Gosha film. And of course, every film is different. But I thought that the cinematography in this film in particular was was excellent. Now, we'll get into the, the kind of film first and then talk a bit more about the behind the scenes afterwards. So... Uh, it's a it's a story about um, it's very basically you know Godfather Part Three, <laughs> um, or at least a little part of that movie. You know, just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. the The story focuses on um, uh, Igawa. Igawa is um, a retired yakuza boss. Uh, he now runs a kind of Spanish themed bar called the Madrid. And um, he keeps to himself, basically, but uh, he will not hesitate to stab someone in the face if they cause any trouble in his bar. But he's now being pressured. He's been retired from the Yakuza for a long time. As Tony Raines mentions on the his feature on the Blu-ray, this is almost an impossible, you know, 
um, scenario in which a Yakuza boss would, would be able to get out of the business, basically. But Egawa was part of this big kind of Yakuza crime syndicate, which went legit. And they moved away from the Yakuza kind of um, name, if you will. So they gave this bar to Egawa as a kind of parting gift. And he's holding on to it. But now they're saying, well, it, it's ours technically. You know, we own it, so we want it back. And he's like, I'm not giving it, I'm not giving it back to you. While this is all happening, um, a famous TV actress who is kind of owned by this legit, you know, Yakuza corporation, you know, they kind of gave her her break. And, you know, for them, they own her now for life. She's been kidnapped by a rival gang. Now they think it's this gang from like West Japan. And the real gang who's kidnapped her are fine with that. So now that there's all there's these three three different gangs going on <laughs> with this kidnapping of this woman uh, Minami, and we got this retired yakuza mob boss Igawa, who for the majority of the movie is is staying out of it. So of course you know this movie is leading to him getting back into it. That's pretty much the the, the brass tacks of the plot. Um, it moves at a, a pace. It's an hour and a half, you know, and. <sighs> I really enjoyed it. I really, really liked it. I think this film has turned me around on the Yakuza genre. Of course, every film is different. Um, but I just think that, you know, as I was watching this, I was like, oh, this is this actually is quite good. The only thing that I struggle with with it, with it I guess, is that in a Yakuza film, for the most part, and like I, I would say the same of this, there's really no redeemable characters. <laughs> you know, every character is pretty much a, a bad person, a murderer, or just, you know, kind of horrible in some aspects. But I do think by the end of the film, I kind of was won over by how everything came to a conclusion in this film, to where I felt like it was really showing us, like, see, this is how <laughs> fruitless and pointless the whole thing is. A life of crime or organized crime never ends well for anybody. You know, everyone loses. Even though there's a few characters at the end of this film who are perceived to win, you just know based on what you've seen throughout this whole film, there's going to be someone else to take their spot eventually. Do you know what I mean? So I really liked it. And the, the last shot of the film I thought was really fun and kind of clever. And, you know, when it when the, the, the title came up at the end, I was like, a little kind of clap there. That was a really, really nice kind of final beat for the film. I, yeah, so I, I enjoyed it. I thought that it was really stylish. There was some fantastic cinematography for me, some great locations. Um, you know, one show in particular, just to, to throw it out there really randomly, there's a, a scene of these two characters and, you know, they're, they're meeting at a bar, uh, or a guy comes in to speak to this woman at a bar and you could just have them sat there at the bar having this conversation. But, you know, Gosha has these beads hanging down in front of them and the man, his face is kind of obscured, whereas her face is a bit more in view because really the focus is on her reaction of what he's telling her. He's delivering this information that's really going to provoke her. And so the focus is on her, but, you know, they're still both obscure. And I just thought it was a nice, I don't know, the lines of it through through the center of the screen and just like, I don't know, the way it framed the characters I thought was just really nice. Little details like that, which don't need to be there, but they just make the frame more interesting. And I feel like he was constantly doing that. I loved how he played with slow motion in the film. There's a character who gets shot at one point in this movie. And, you know, it, there's a struggle, there's a gunshot, and then we cut to like a profile view. And we see a squib explode from this person in the back, you know, and it's a pop and there's blood and it's in slow motion and the blood starts trickling down their back and then they back into this wall. And as they slide down, as they, as they take their last dying breaths, um, you can actually see the breath come out. Like when it's really cold and you get that kind of vapor. And I just thought it was such a great, like capturing of a, a theatrical death in a movie. Like that was so cool to me. It's a brutal movie. It's bloody. It's violent, you know, it certainly doesn't hold back on a lot of the, you know, trappings of, of the Yakuza genre, which would be a lot of knives, you know, there's a character who goes around with a kind of a scalpel and does some pretty serious damage to a number of characters, and there's lots of gunplay. Now, Tony Raines raised an interesting point that I'd never considered. Um, he said that for a Yakuza film like this to have all these guns and, you know, shootouts and everything is pretty much a fantasy because guns are so hard to get hold of in Japan at that time. I don't know if that's the same now. He said the only place you'd really get that kind of quantity of, of guns and weaponry would be the US military. And they're very you know, strict about their weapons and stuff. So 
Um, there's even a bit in the movie where Egawa finally decides he's gonna, you know, <laughs> he's gonna get pulled back into this whole Yakuza mess, but he needs a gun. So he goes to this gun merchant, and you actually see there's like a board with like um, schematics for guns, which I didn't really think anything of, but as Tony Raines mentioned in the feature that he does for the Blu-ray, there were certain shops that were kind of set up in Japan, kind of illicit, you know, workshops where they would try and just build their own guns out of necessity. But, you know, he said that, with, you know, guns going off all over the place was not something you would see in the Yakuza, um, but it was a lot of, you know, blades, knives, you know, and uh, blunt objects. So, but you get a bit of both in this. <laughs> you get a bit of variety to your bloodshed, that's for sure. There's a couple of, like, fights in this that, like, proper scraps. Like, it's just two guys grabbing onto each other and just kind of, like, rolling around a bit. And I, I, I like that kind of, it's like a kind of kinetic realism where it's just two guys just jostling and it feels really, like, raw and believable. As opposed to some of the, like, you know, the punch and the duck and the boof and the baff. You know, even some of these, you know, Hong Kong martial arts films that I love so much. You know, they're, you know, it's, it's very choreographed. But just two guys, <laughs> a real fight is just two guys just, you know, just lumping in on each other and it's a mess and it doesn't look very theatrical or nice. And there's a few bits of that in this film that I quite liked. The gun merchant that Agawa goes to, who plays a number of characters, I think. I think he, he plays a few roles in the Battles Without Honor and Humanity series. And I kind of instantly recognized him. I haven't seen those films, but a number of years ago I got hired by Arrow Video to do a montage trailer of all of their Japanese action releases. So they sent me all the Blu-rays that they had and it, the whole six, you know, Battles of the Honor and Humanity series came along with it. So I'd scan through all six of those movies just to get clips and he's a very recognizable figure. But um, yeah, Bunta was a very memorable part of this film, kind of a cameo of sorts, where he he's going to sell the gun to Agawa, or the guns, but he wants to come along to watch. He's like, I miss the action. Can I just come and watch when you go and blow, you know, when you go and shoot up the place? And Agawa's like, no, definitely not. And he's like, oh, come on, I just want to see some action. You know, it's been ages. And Agawa's like, even for you, it's a no. And then he's like, well, I just won't sell you the guns then. So uh, along he comes, and he's just sat in the back of this car. There's mayhem, there's bullets flying everywhere. He's got a headset on with this big kind of <laughs> like stereo, and he's drinking, I think, a bottle of Coke, and then occasionally he pops out with a shotgun and, and then just casually goes back to, like, you know, <laughs> I don't know, having 40 winks. It's a very strange character and cameo, but kind of entertaining amidst all the chaos in that moment in the third act of the film. Um... One very random thing I wanted to point out because it, it really threw me for a loop was what there's a phone call between two of the real higher ups in the Yakuza you know business, and one of them has got this like phone that is like completely covered with like a paisley pattern, and it's just such a weird like it looks like something a grandma might have, and it just kind of undercut this <laughs> the seriousness of the moment for which like, what the fuck is this paisley phone all about? A very strange uh, thing that just I don't know. It, it just jumped out to me and I think burned into my brain, you know, from the minute I stopped watching the film. I was like, oh yeah, I've got a member of that Paisley phone for some reason. It's just going to stick in my head. Another thing I really loved about this film is a tiny little micro detail. It's when the gang who kidnaps Minami, the actress, you know, they've realized now that they've got this. They've got the Yakuza gang, gang by the balls and they're going to get all this money they, that they want for a ransom. And it's a group of guys, you've never really seen them before. There's not really much characterization there. There's so many characters in this film, you'd never be able to sit down and get all the backstories and stuff. But there's this one character who's just in the, in the center of the screen. And there's another one to his, to his right, screen left. And he's just looking up at this guy, who's presumably his friend. And he just kind of taps him on the arm and just gives him this look. And, and the other guy grabs the other guy by the arm. And it's kind of like, a, we, we fucking did it. We, we, you know, and you just, I just, the guy on the right there or the left of the screen, he, what an amazing micro performance. Like I totally believed in everything he was saying with his eyes in the, in his body language in that scene, he was conveying to me, like, I was almost like, it was almost like he threw this picture of a backstory between these two characters into my head just through how convincing his performance was, where he's, the way he's looking at him, like, he's, you know, we did it. Yeah, yeah it, it, there's so much implied in that, and it's so believable. You know, I don't know, maybe I'm just crazy, but I just thought that little detail 
added so much, and I just thought that was a an excellent performance by whoever that actor was, whatever the character was, I don't know, but that was just, it really just kind of captured me for a moment, which was really, really good. There's a very memorable kind of horrible scene where Minami, the actress who's been kidnapped, she's she's kind of in, in a room alone with one of the gang members, and he suddenly decides he's going to have a bit of fun with her. I use the word fun um, completely ironically, you know, he seems to have very devious intentions and horrible intentions really but before he takes her mask off um he puts on a mask of his own now she has just some like eye blinders like this he puts on a full gorilla mask and he's just looking at her and it's so fucking like scary i don't know it's the eyes that are kind of bulging out of that mask it's very intimidating and it's it's again one of those mental images that is very striking. And speaking of masks, there's a sequence where um, they're sending money from from, <laughs> from this like um, building that's being constructed. Um, a bag of money gets sent down to a guy on the floor below. Now this is a lot of money that they're dealing with. They want to kind of make sure that it gets out, you know, without any kind of um, entanglements. And so <laughs> the genius plan they've got is the guy on the ground who's collecting the money puts on a Boris Karloff Frankenstein mask. And you're thinking, where the hell is this going? And then suddenly you see him walking through the city, you know, through the streets of Tokyo, and he's got the Boris Karloff mask on, he's got the 100 million yen in his hand, and he's also holding up a sign that's advertising for like a, a horror themed cabaret show, you know. And I just thought that was a brilliant little bit of, you know, in, in ingenuity of like, you know, okay, they, you know, they, they kidnap the actress, they put out the ransom, they get the money at this kind of nondescript location, but how do they get out of that location? discreetly they give it to a guy who's dressed as fucking boris karloff you know <laughs> he's advertising this this club i thought that was a really cool part of the the movie i really liked the lead performance by noburu ando who plays um igawa and the fascinating thing which really surprised me although you know you just think he's a good actor and maybe he still is but um apparently the story with uh, ando is that he was a yakuza boss in the 50s and went to jail for six years um, and then he came out and he, he wrote a book about his experiences, you know, doing time, being in the Yakuza. Uh, and hey, Tony Raines talks about how impossible it is to get out of the Yakuza. Well, here's a guy who got out of the Yakuza, I guess. So I guess it, it proves the, the, the point, or it disproves the point he was making uh, in, in some sense. And then he went on to be an actor. Um, but he, he has a kind of Bogart quality to him, you know, especially he's like he runs the bar. There's, there's a girl that got away, you know, who married someone else when he was in jail and stuff. And But but he has a very kind of, you know, it's a kind of that cool factor. You know, he's, he's cool, he's calm, he's collected. And there's another guy who's trying to, like, persuade him to do the right thing throughout the film. And this is one scene where they're both kind of, they have this meeting and they've got, like, a, a glass in front of them with a tissue and a coin in the middle. And they're both taking turns in kind of burning little holes into it. You never see the coin actually drop and see who who wins, I suppose. But that was kind of just a cool... Again, these little visual details I really liked in the film. I think there's a lot of nice visual flourishes that... It just made it a nice film to look at. You know, there's just... And the way the camera is moving, like... You know, you don't just cut to another character in the, in, in, within a scene. You know, the camera will pull back and turn around and that, and focus on someone else's face as they turn around. And I just think the... The way, you know, Hideo Gosha directed this really just made it a, a nicely um, directed, you know, visually interesting film. There's not to, I can't really analyze it more than that. I just think that it's well shot and it's, you know, there's nothing boring about the cinematography. Like it's, it's a pretty kinetic kind of looking film and it's, you know, it's very well edited and put together. Um, yes, yeah, for me, the only thing that really holds back from it is that it is kind of just a film with horrible people who <laughs> are killing each other, and there's not really a grander kind of, you know, uh, hook to kind of, you know, really root for the protagonist, you know, you, you get the feeling that it's all, all for noughts, really, but, you know, it's, again, it is kind of an ode to, you know, violent ode to the pitfalls and the, the pointlessness of organized crime, I think, that's the way I would, would view this story. But uh, yeah, there's good performances and uh, and it moves at a really good pace. So let's get into the the extras. At, f at first glance, there's pretty light on extras. This release, um, there's no commentary, you know, which is almost like you know madness to me at this point because I've been I think I've been covering like every Eureka release for like the past 
five months now, I think. And it, there's always at least, you know, one commentary, if not multiple. Um, but we have, it's a 2K restoration from the original film at Elements. I thought it was a really good transfer. This film looked really good on Blu-ray. Um, and yeah, and I feel like this is like a, a lesser known Yakuza film. So I like that. I like it when it isn't like the the heavy hitters. It's the kind of, you know, the, the films on the fringe that kind of get releases from companies like this, you know, that I've never heard of. And it's like, yeah, this is really good. Like, you know, that kind of almost comes out of nowhere for someone like me who isn't too well versed in the genre. Um, there's an introduction to Violent Streets and the works of director Hideo Gosha by film critic Tony Raines. This is a fantastic piece, it's about 37 minutes long, I think. And, you know, it's Tony Raines. Like, he he has a kind of conversational way of relaying a lot of the information that he knows um, that's, that's, you know, it's fun to listen to, it's informative. He goes a lot into the different kind of film studios in Japan, like Toei and Toho, Nakatsu, um, and how at one point, many, many decades ago, um, the Japanese government kind of consolidated all the film studios, so there were only three of them. And he talks about how, you know, different you know, different studios focused on different genres and things, and Toei, who, who made this, and he kind of explained the origin of the, the, the name Toei, which is taking Tokyo, and uh, Eiga, uh, which I believe is movie, film. So Tokyo, Eiga, Toei, meaning Tokyo movie, I suppose. And he talks about the director Hideo Gosha, he talks about some of the actors in the film, including Ando and his kind of history being a Yakuza boss himself. Um, great, great piece by Tony Raines. You know, like he really, he adds a lot of context to stuff. And, uh, you know, yeah, he's one of my favorite people to listen to when it comes to, to, to kind of special features and stuff. Then there's Fighting in the Streets, a video essay by writer and filmmaker Jasper Sharp. It's about 12, 13 minutes long. This is pretty good. I, I just think when you got Tony Raines on there, it kind of shits over everything else. Um, you know, it was a good little video essay. It suffered a little bit for me from, he, he talks about other films that Gosha made. But the only footage they've got to use on screen is from Violent Streets. So it's like random scenes from Violent Streets while he's talking about the plot and scenes from another movie. And it kind of it doesn't quite, you know, as a visual thing. Um, otherwise, it was very well done. And there's some good information in there. Um, original theatrical trailer. I always love the inclusion of those. <laughs> And then we have um, a booklet which has a new essay by Japanese cinema expert Tom Mez. This is Rule Breaker, Hideo Gosha, and Violent Streets. This is a good essay. I, I enjoyed this. Again, it, it kind of really heavily focuses on Hideo Gosha's background and how he got into making movies and working in television, kind of making the jump to, to movies, working in the Yakuza genre, other notable kind of Yakuza films from you know that era from the 60s leading into the 70s, and then you know where Hideo Gosha's kind of career went after that into the 1980s and so on and so forth. You get like a Japanese poster there. There's a couple of images throughout the booklet. Here at the front, you have that scene with the coin, which is, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, you know, it's a, it's a very, it's one of those things that just, you know, it doesn't go anywhere. It's just a, it's an interesting backdrop to their conversation as they're kind of having it over the uh, over the, the table together in the bar. Um, no reversible sleeve. We just have a nice um, black and white image there of some of the main characters from the film. And uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, I really enjoyed the film. It surprised me. And I, I was kind of hoping that it would, um, you know, without forcing myself to like it. Um, I, I don't know. This it's just a very visceral kind of I don't know that kind of violence. It reminds me of the stuff that I watched when I was a kid. To be honest, you know the the really brutal action films in the eighties and nineties. Um, but there's like a a rawness to it, I guess, which is probably inherent in a lot of other yakuza films as well, where you know there's just knives and lots of blood. None of it is really too. I mean, it is glorified on one hand, and on the other hand, it isn't. You know, but it's not like, I don't know, it doesn't feel as like adrenaline pumping as like an Arnold Schwarzenegger bloodbath. It's more, you know, back alleys and streets and slit throats and stuff. And it's, you know, it's a grim kind of, it lives up to the title of Violent Streets, I suppose. So there we go. That was my thoughts on spine number 273.
of the MOC collection. As of now, we don't have um, a next one. Uh, March and April of 2023, there are no new MOC releases, so we'll see if May will change that. Um, so I'm kind of intrigued now if we'll, if we'll get to <laughs> spine number 300 and, and what might await us there. But anyway, another good entry into the MOC um, collection. I uh, hope you enjoyed this review. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.